Okay, hello everyone and welcome to our Are You Ready to Garden session. Uh, my name is Bill Lubick and I'm with Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Middlesex County. And we're, we're gonna have a series of webinars over the next four weeks that are going to really show people how to grow vegetables, how to produce their own food. Um, we're gonna provide some techniques over that period of time that will help you get started. Uh, show you some great varieties that you can grow in your garden. And I want to thank the people that are helping out before we even get started. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Dave Snell for helping put this together, and Lamonahan, uh, Brennan Pearsall, and Rich Weidman, who are uh, on there to uh, take a look at what your questions are. So when you go in the chat box up in the upper right-hand corner, um, you're going to see uh, you can actually click on that. You can uh, click in your questions below, and then Dave will send those questions to me as we're talking today. Um, first, I just want to also thank um, our partners. Uh, Rutgers Cooperative Extension is a partnership between uh, the counties and, in our case, Middlesex County. Um, and we get great support from our county freeholders, which is um, greatly appreciated because we wouldn't be here without their support. And we're actually an outreach arm of the University, Rutgers University's New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. So our mission is to get information from the university out to the people uh, so that they can utilize that information. And we help to solve a lot of problems in environmental and agriculture uh, issues in real time. Without fur further ado, let's get started here. Um, and if you have questions, please feel free to send those along to Dave or Angela. So just to give you a little bit of my background, um, I grew up on Lubbock Farms, uh, mid middle part of the state of New Jersey, and uh, been active my whole life uh, uh, working on the farm and also functioning as a Middlesex County Agricultural Agent, uh, which means I have a very diverse set of duties. Uh, my area is working with um, specialty crops, uh, doing uh, education and research in that area it has been ongoing for uh, 30 years now. So it's been a uh, a great career, and I've also had a chance to actually do a lot of hands-on farming, and you see here are greenhouses, and we're actually going to take a look inside those greenhouses that you see right there at some of the plants that we're growing, and I'm going to tell you some of the favorites uh, of my plants and also uh, favorites uh, that have been popular over the past uh, 30 years um, on Rutgers Day or Ag Field Day. Here's just a quick, quick shot just to show you the inside of the greenhouse before we get started too far. But we've got that uh, greenhouse just packed with plants of all different stages. You're going to have a chance uh, to see some of our favorites uh, here today because i got some close-up and um, personal shots of a lot of our favorite vegetables as well as a lot of good information today that I think you'll get a lot of good information that you can share with your family. And Are you? So... Let's just get started with some for uh, healthy vegetable plants and some of the things that we're going to do today. One of the things we're going to cover is uh, the garden. Uh, I'm just talking a little bit about selecting a location, a little bit about soils, why do we select certain varieties over others. Uh, we're going to talk about seeding areas or how to properly seed in greenhouses. Uh, the type of mix that we use and why we use certain mixes to grow vegetable plants. Uh, we're talk about planting of transplants, uh, proper watering and fertilization, uh, a little bit on harvesting. We actually will go into harvesting and, and storage and food preparation a little bit uh, in more detail uh, in later versions of the Are You Ready to Garden? Okay, let's first start off with planning and record keeping, which is really important uh, no matter what level you're at. But you want to keep good records of varieties that have worked for you uh, in your particular setting, uh, varieties that you like the flavor of, that have performed well in pots or the containers that you have, um, list any problems that you've had with diseases or insect issues. But most of all, you want to grow things that taste great, uh, um, that you really enjoy, and really kind of function, uh, you know, focus your energy on areas where you're growing things that you may not be able to get locally or unique varieties or just, you know, something that you can produce relatively easily. So we're going to talk about that today. How do you grow these vegetables? Um, 
to make it uh, easy for your family to go out and have fresh products. And this by no means uh, replaces going out to local farms. As a matter of fact, we highly encourage uh, everyone to go out and visit their local farms and pick your own. They're going to be functioning this year as well as many of the markets. And they, uh, if they haven't started already in your area, they will be starting soon. So strongly encourage you to support your local farmers because even though we can produce a little bit in our gardens, we're never able to produce everything that we need. Um, so you also want to keep track when you're keeping your records on uh, harvest dates, on how long it took to actually take that from seed to harvest, any special techniques that you used in the garden as well. And when you're choosing varieties, one of the things we look for is uh, varieties that are relatively easy to grow, do they have a short uh, window from the time you seed them to harvest? Uh, we'll be focusing on a lot of those vegetables today, um, especially do you like the flavor of that vegetable? And vegetables can uh, change in flavor depending on the soils that they're in and depending on types of fertility uh, that we put into those vegetables. And we'll see dramatic changes even when we've had flavor or uh, taste test at our different research farms throughout the state. I've noticed that we go to different farms with different soils and different techniques, uh, the same variety would actually have a different flavor. I also want to look for disease resistance. And if you look to the right of this slide, you see that here are Celebrity Tomato, which is a very good tomato we're going to be talking about today. It's an all-America winner. Um, and it'll have these letters often on the seed packet. Uh, and it'll be a V or an F or an N or a T. And they simply stand for resistance to verticillium wilt, which is a fungus. F stands for resistance to Vizarium wilt. N is for nematode resistance and T for tobacco mosaic virus resistance. Um, and as it notes on the top, it's 70 days, so that's 70 days from the time of seeding to uh, be able to harvest. Um, and it indicates that it's a medium-sized determinant fruit. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So you can get a lot of information uh, on variety, either on the seed packet or if you can look up the name on the Internet to find uh, more detail. And within that, you'll also find whether or not varieties are adapted to uh, our particular growing conditions. Um, you know, there are certain varieties that you test out and farmers will test out many varieties each year to determine what works best for their soil conditions and their climatic conditions. And if you're starting a garden, you know, you could be starting out from scratch where you're, you know, basically going out and uh, turning under, removing turf and then starting to turn the soil with a, a garden spade. Um, or you, you know, you could have a formalized or very informal garden with simple uh, pots and we're going to show you how to very creative with pots so that you can, no matter what you have, you can actually get started gardening very easily. Um, so you don't have to have a formal garden. Also show us a shot at the bottom here of compost being sifted. Uh, a simple compost sifter you can make so that you can utilize your own home compost uh, for your vegetable garden. Uh, and that's an, a very important thing to add to your vegetable garden as we'll get into that. But composting can transform mediocre soils very quickly into productive uh, soils for vegetables. And here's just uh, some creative containers that uh, people have on the left. Uh, you can see the, the uh, wood container that you could utilize, and that would focus so that wherever you have sunlight coming in, um, you could move that container as long as the soil that's there um, is not a heavy soil. So you would use the grow mixes that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, or you could use buckets, and we're, we're going to talk about how you can transform um, certain types of, of buckets and other pots uh, into self-watering containers in a minute here. But what, one thing you want to make sure is that you have adequate drainage no matter what you use. So whatever container you're using, you want to make sure you have holes in the bottom of that and you have a, a good grow mix that will allow you to um, basically uh, get good air penetration into the soil it will hold nutrients and water, uh, but not create a problem for you. So here we uh, see a, a very inexpensive uh, self-watering container, um, just simply two five-gallon buckets with a PVC pipe that runs down uh, to the bottom bucket so you can fill up uh, the bucket on the bottom. But very inexpensive, you simply go out and buy two five-gallon uh, watering uh, gallon buckets um, and then you put soil and uh, basically grow mix in the bottom, 
And by doing that and having a pot with holes in it right in the center, by creating a little bit larger hole in the center, um, you can actually wick that water up. So if you fill the bottom portion of that, it'll wick the water up into the top parts of the plant. So simple technique, and we'll put that um, directions on how to make that on the website. On a next week's video, we'll probably cover that in a little bit more detail because we'll actually show um, how we do that. Also, it's very important to know where your orientation of the sun is because many of the uh, warm season vegetables that we grow um, are going to be those that require anywhere from six to eight hours of sunlight. So um, we want to make sure that we're not shading vegetables that require maximal sunlight in order to get um, adequate production. So those are going to be your solanaceous crops like eggplant, tomatoes, and peppers, and potatoes, and cucurbits, uh, you know, cucumbers and melons. They're going to want a lot of sunlight. So the more sunlight, the better. If they get eight to ten hours of direct sunlight, uh, you're going to see healthier plants in those areas. Any questions, uh, Brandon, do you see there so far? Yes. So we have someone wondering about uh, mosquitoes being an issue for self-watering pots. Is that something that you've found to be the case? Typically, the uh, mosquitoes are not a problem if you put a lid on that. And actually, what you can do is you could take some landscape fabric and just create um, a piece right from the top of that so that the tomato is coming through the center. And then the landscape fabric is right around it. Um, and that will keep any mosquitoes from actually getting in and out of there, or at least reduce the amount. Um, you could also dump the water periodically and, and, and uh, you have clean water fill at the bottom, um, and that will prevent any problems. But typically, we have not seen that as an issue. Any other questions? Uh, is there any, any risk of root rot from uh, being consistently wet? Um, well, you're going to fill the bottom, but you're, it's going to wick the water up from the bottom. So um, if you do it right and you don't overfill that container, and put too much water in there. So there is a risk of that if you don't properly fill that container. Um, so you, once it gets to the top of that level, and you can actually even lift the, the top bucket up to see how full it is, um, you want it to wick the water up from the bottom and then periodically just check around the root with your fingers to determine whether or not there's enough moisture getting to the top of that. Um, we can talk more about that next week, too. Um, so soil testing is very important. Um, for most of our vegetables that we're growing, we want that pH to be between about 6 to 6.5. Um, so you can do a, uh, unfortunately, the soil testing lab right now is not open, but will be hopefully soon. Um, but you can test uh, the soil. We'll put something online to explain further about soil testing. Um, one way to bring that pH in uh, almost immediately where you need it is to add peat moss or add uh, home compost that's finished to your mix. And by doing that, you're going to bring that pH within that range and have availability of nutrients exactly where you need it, in that 6 to 6.5 range. So typically, wherever we're testing soils, we go out to 15 to 20 uh, different areas within that area. If it's your vegetable garden, that's area one. Um, you get out six to eight inches, take a core, but you want to remove any organic materials like the roots uh, and any other plant material on the surface and just have about 15 to 20 cores. Mix that up in a bucket really well, dry that down, and then use that for sampling. Um, you can dry that soil down on the tarp um, and then simply add 50% distilled water on 50% soil and then test it with a, either a pH meter or you can use uh, pH paper as well. So. Relatively easy to do to give you a rough estimate of what the pH is. Um, let's talk about starting seedlings. So some people will have maybe a simple setup uh, in their basement or next to a window uh, where they'll have uh, fluorescent light. Um, and it's good to use a one warm and one cool fluorescent light to give you the range uh, of light that you will need for these plants. And in this slide, they have the light a little bit too far away. I like to keep those lights uh, down a little bit closer to the plant, like four to six inches away. You want to make sure you're not getting too much heat to the top of the plant. And if you can keep, uh, also what, what you really want to do is if you can bring in supplemental light and have reflective um, areas around that um, where it's going to reflect more light onto the plants, you're going to have healthier plants. So if you could put that next to a southern window or whatever, so the light that you're providing as well as additional light from outside, you're going to have healthier transplants. We're going to talk about temperatures. We get into this, but you don't want to have 
fluctuations in temperature in the evening. Uh, you know, if, if your plants are close to a windowsill or close to heaters, you want to pull them away from those areas so that they don't dry out or it doesn't get too cold at night because it's that variability or that change in temperature which can actually cause a problem. And we're going to get into soil mix in a few minutes here. Uh, so just briefly, Bill, uh, we do have a couple yes. questions coming in. Sure. Go ahead. Um, uh, one about any vegetables that can be grown in partial to full shade. I think we're going to get a little more into varieties in a few minutes, right? Correct, yeah. Um, so the shade, any of the greens um, can grow under uh, lower light conditions. So when we talk about, you know, lettuce and, and uh, you know, uh, kale and endive and spinach, um, we can get away with less light because we're not producing fruit. So typically if you look at greens, um, and, and even some root crops, but root crops require a little bit more light, and then crops that are actually producing a fruit will require anywhere from eight to ten hours of sun, direct sunlight. Um, and also one question about how do you keep seedlings from getting leggy? Okay, so you keep seedlings from getting leggy by maximizing the light and not overdoing it with fertilizer. So. Um, uh, what, what you want to do is you want to provide as much light as you possibly can to those seedlings. Now, where we have greenhouses, we can optimize um, the amount of light that's getting to the plants. Or we don't have a greenhouse, you would use a southern window location, and then you could supplement that light uh, with overhead fluorescent lights as well. Um, there are high, um, uh, there are some lights, grow lights like T5 lights that can also be used to provide additional lighting for plants. Um, but if you want to go lower tech and you don't have a lot of money to spend, you can just use the warm and cool fluorescent lights and um, keep that as much light as you can getting to those plants. But so let's talk a little bit about grow mix for starting vegetables. Um, there's many different mixes out there, but basically they're different combinations of peat moss, vermiculite, and perlite. Um, and you can even add up to 30% of your own homemade compost in there, uh, depending on what you're growing. Um, if you want to try to save a little bit of money, you just have to make sure that your homemade compost is completely broken down uh, and you would not want to use compost that's from an area where you've had a lot of disease problems. Uh, you want to avoid garden soils and pots and starting your um, high value, especially crop vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant, because if you use garden soils, you could have a disease called damping off, which could be very problematic. Um, so we want to use what's called sterilized potting soil. So when you go into uh, a store, you'll actually see called sterilized potting soil or potting soil. And it should have these ingredients, peat moss, vermiculite, and perlite within it. Um, and there are different types of mixes that will give you some kind of wetting agents in them so they keep the plants moist over a longer period of time. You don't necessarily have to have that if you're keeping a close eye on those plants. Um, but just make sure you avoid garden soil. Also, do not buy what's called topsoil in bags. I would avoid that because there could be other contaminants in that. Okay, let's go. Any questions on that so far? Uh, just one about the, the possibility of using manure instead of peat moss in a mix. Okay, um, you can use well-rotted compost of manures. I would not use any fresh material. I would especially not use any uh, manure from domesticated animals uh, directly in a mix for the contamination issues. Um, also, any fresh manure is actually going to burn the roots of the plant. Um, so typically, if you have a well-composted material that was, um, you know, that you can't recognize any of the original ingredients, I don't use that to start plants, but you could use it around plants for fertility and work it into the soil maybe in the beginning of the garden year. Um, you wouldn't want to keep um, utilizing that or utilize too much of that. You've got to be very careful. They, these are the basic three ingredients that are in any grow mix, peat moss, vermiculite, and perlite uh, in different concentrations. Uh, and there could be other elements in there to provide um, more oxygen to the plants to make it a little bit more fluffy. The peat moss actually provides the organic base um, so that the plants can get started. Uh, and the others provide porosity and some nutrient holding capacity. Um, be careful with Epsom salts. I see some people using Epsom salts and other materials, but um, it does add, mag add magnesium, but uh, we've seen uh, overdoses of use of Epsom salts because it was on some 
uh, on different articles that were out there, and it can burn the plants. So you got to be very careful um, and use it only if you have a magnesium deficiency. Uh, and there's certain plants that require just a tad of that. For instance, if you're growing marigolds, sometimes you see a little bit of magnesium deficiency. So you just give them a little tiny bit, like a like a, a little tiny pinch within um, you know a bucket of water, and that's all you use for that. Um, we typically don't see a lot of magnesium deficiency in many of our mixes uh, and even out in the field, but that's why you want a soil test to tell you exactly what's going on. So when you get plants started, um, now after reading your seed packet and picking the right mix, um, then we want to go in and we want to follow the directions on the seed packet. It'll tell you exactly how deep to plant those seeds in the soil uh, and then cover them over with the correct amount of grow mix, and then keep them watered, but don't oversaturate them. Um, some people tend to oversaturate the seed, and what happens is um, the seed can rot in the ground, or you can have some damping off issues with the disease uh, with uh, with the plants themselves. So you really want to keep the soil moist so that the seed will germinate, uh, but not overly moist so the seed will rot. Also, when you add too much water, you actually cut off the oxygen to those tender root systems which makes it very difficult for these plants to continue growing. Uh, so we really need to provide um, moisture, adequate moisture, but not overly saturated conditions. Any questions on uh, watering those young tender plants, Brendan? Um, just simply a question of uh, using potting soil with fertilizer added. I believe this would be like the potting mix that you might get at your local big box store. You can use uh, the mixes, um, and they're fine. You just want to be careful um, adding any kind of fertilizer. When you uh, get started, you've got to be careful because you don't want to over-fertilize plants. Some of the mixes will come with a uh, low to moderate amount of fertilizer just to get the plants started. Uh, and then if you see the plants starting to turn a little bit yellow or a little off color, you can add a very light dose of uh, fertilizer, liquid-soluble fertilizer to that to help those plants green up. Um, if you are an organic producer, uh, there's many uh, OMRI-approved products, which uh, have the letters O-M-R-I at the bottom of the fertilizer, uh, which stands for Organic Materials Research Institute. You can find those in stores or online. So there are organic substitutes that you can use if you don't want to use traditional fertilizers, um, fish emulsions, and other materials out there um, that are fine, and certain types of blood meal can be used. Uh, as well that will give the plants a shot of nitrogen if they need it. Just be very judicious on the amount of uh, fertilizer that you add because some people tend to over-fertilize young seedlings. Um, if you do that, they can become etiolated or leggy at that point, so we want to make sure that we're not overdoing it with fertilizer or water. Uh, here you see some healthy transplants, and we don't pack the soil, overly pack the soil. They should be up and anywhere from 10, day, 10 to 14 days, many of the different plants that we start. Um, you can get these little plastic recyclable trays, or you could just even use um, some of the clamshells that you save in the store, but just punch some holes in the bottom of that, some small holes all throughout the bottom, so that if you use the clamshells, and once they're cleaned out, uh, you can go ahead and add a mix in there. So there's a lot of creative things you can use to start your seedlings, and then you just put the grow mix within there, but just make sure, like I said, that you punch holes in the bottom of that so that they can drain properly, um, because keeping plants healthy means keeping them drained properly. Any questions there from anybody? So here you see where we're actually spotting plants. Um, most people won't necessarily do this in a home setting, but when we're growing for commercial. We, we may start a bunch of one variety, and then we take those little seedlings, and we once they get up about two inches, I'll actually tease those out very carefully into individual trays, as you see on the right-hand side. And if you were to grow a bunch of flowers, you could do the same thing. So this way, it takes up less space in starting the seedlings. Or if you want to test if old seeds are any good, um, you could do this. You could put them in and see if they germinate on uh, how quickly they germinate and come up. And then you could spot those out into individual trays. This works very well with tomatoes, peppers, egg plants. Uh, it's very easy to spot those plants out. So here is a list, um, a handy list of what can be direct seeded into the garden. Uh, many of these plants that I have on here for direct seeding, you would want to do that after uh, our frost date of May 15th. 
um, especially with beans um, and some of the other beans and melons. We, you know, we may wait till the third or fourth week of May uh, to direct seed, but even even the third week of May should work fine. Radishes, we can go out early, and spinach, we can definitely go out earlier in the season in the spring uh, to seed those directly in the garden. Uh, it'll say right on the seed packet how deep it land each seed. Um, and also, we're going to talk about many of these different crops as we go through today, but turnips, zucchini, and melon, they can all also be direct seeded. On the right-hand side are many of the plants you're going to see within our uh, commercial production greenhouses, uh, where we actually start the plants uh, as seedlings in trays, uh, and then spot them out into larger tray units um, and then set them out in the field once they uh, have obtained a um, size that uh, we feel is sufficient that they're going to do well and survive uh, in outside conditions. And that could be eggplant and collards and broccoli, leeks, uh, peppers, scallions, and tomatoes. We can start those in trays in the greenhouse and then take them out to the field. Here you see some uh, salt some small tomato seedlings that we actually have spotted into the individual pots. And then from there, they can get quite large before we put them out in the field. You know, we don't want them to get too big or too leggy. This allows their root systems to expand, uh, plenty of light to get to each one of those plants, um, and it provides for healthier conditions for that plant. Here we see a, a heating mat that we use. And if you're going to grow hot peppers or certain peppers that are somewhat difficult, uh, like especially the, the, uh, some of the ghost peppers, we like to use a um, heating pad that's specifically for plants in a greenhouse. You don't want to use any type of other material. You want to use something that's labeled and certified for use in a greenhouse. What that does is that uh, he, uh, heating device or that heating mat actually bring those temperatures up into the high 60s, low 70s to help those plants germinate quicker. Uh, the faster we can germinate those plants and get them up and going, uh, the healthier those plants are going to be. And so this is a, especially good if you're starting pepper plants. Let's talk about some greens that are easy to grow for anyone. So briefly, uh, Bill, we do have a few questions that are coming in. Okay. Um, so about seedlings, um, we have some questions about teasing the plants out, um, starting seeds in water overnight to speed up germination. And, uh, for example, tomato seedlings, when would you typically separate them and, and tease them out? Um, usually when the plant, um, you know, when you start to see, they, they, they'll usually get about two inches in height. Um, and then that's a good time to separate them out. Um, you see them start to actually turn solid green um, to go after the uh, uh at that point, usually it's about three to four weeks into it, you'll, you can actually spot those plants out. It really depends on the temperature uh, of the house or the greenhouse that they're in. Um, you don't want to let them get too long because if you let them get too big, they're more difficult to tease out. And when you tease them out, you got to be very careful with your fingers to slowly separate those so that when you go to spot them into individual pots uh, or larger trays, uh, you don't do any damage to the root system. Um, and some, some plants like tomatoes and peppers, eggplant, are much easier to do than some others. Hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions there, Brendan? Uh, Angela, did you see any that needed to be addressed to Bill? Yes. On the Q&A, there was a question about uh, dampening off uh, remedies. So, so do you have any recommendations for preventing dampening off in seedlings? Damping off? Yes. Um, so damping off several things that we can do to prevent damping off. Number one, use a sterilized potting mix with um, peat moss, vermiculite, and perlite in it. Make sure that the potting mix doesn't get overly saturated. Also, make sure that the containers you're growing the plants in or starting plants in have been um, thoroughly washed out. Uh, typically, we'll wash um, our old pots out with a 10% Clorox solution or hypo, uh, different types of materials that I can get any residuals out. We'll wash the pots out real good with water, uh, then use a 10% Clorox solution, and then wash them out again to rinse that out. And we can put them in, the, soak them in that mix for about 20 minutes. It won't kill any residuals. So if you start out with clean mix with clean pots um, and you don't overwater the plants, you can really prevent damping off. Any other questions, Angela or Brendan? So 
uh, lettuce is something that um, is easy to grow. Um, and what I typically will do is grow lettuce in pots or long uh, extended flower pots, as you see here, so that I can keep starting it in these containers. I can keep it up off the ground so the rabbits don't get in, and I can even hang it on the side of my fence in my garden if I want to to keep other rabbits away from it if they do happen to sneak into my garden. Um, also, if, if you have lettuce in pots, you can kind of move it around. Lettuce doesn't like the afternoon sun. So uh, in order for, to prevent uh, our lettuce from bolting, uh, we could put it in a place where in the afternoon it's not getting so much sun or just has partial shade for part of the day in the afternoon. Um, we also want to buy slow bolting varieties. So many of the varieties of lettuce that are uh, available now will say right on the seed packet, slow to bolt. Um, I really recommend growing the leaf lettuces. Um, uh, very quick to produce, and then you take off the, the seeds that you want um, as they're fresh and for your salads. Um, and you can set this up while you're planting every couple weeks so that you have a fresh crop of lettuce coming up um, uh, throughout the entire spring and into the beginning part of the summer. As it gets a little bit hotter, it's, it's more difficult to grow these crops, so you need to shade them a little bit more and make sure that you're using slow bolting varieties um, if you want to grow them. It's more difficult though when you get into the hotter part of the season. So what happens with lettuce is it actually can go dormant at high temperatures, so it doesn't even germinate properly. Um, so we can do direct seeding out in the garden, but we've got to do it early in the spring. Um, usually we sow uh, seeds about one inch apart in rows that are about uh, a foot apart. Um, continuous planting every two or three weeks if you're going to put it right in the garden. Just got to make sure you've got that fence up, otherwise you're going to have uh, rabbits and other animals getting in there and eating every last uh, plant that you put in. Um, and then, as I said before, you might want to shade some of those plants on sunny days in the afternoon to prevent those plants from bolting. A lot of different types of lettuce to grow out there, red leaf uh, type lettuce. Uh, and all these lettuce, uh, the important thing to remember is to harvest them when they're young and tender. Uh, green leaf lettuce is another one that's a good one. So if you're looking for a combination, sometimes you can get uh, combination packets that have a mixture of different types of lettuce or just simply um, get the seeds. And then if you want a mixture of colors, you can do that yourself. There's oak leaf lettuce and red sales, which is very common. Um, when you plant these, you're basically just uh, planting them in these uh, containers that we were talking about that have been cleaned out, lightly cover them with soil, keep them moist. Uh, and you should see in about 10 days these guys coming up through that mix. Another good one that we've tried is called Salad Bowl, which produces very quickly, um, has excellent flavor to it. Um, uh, spinach is a little bit more challenging, uh, especially as we get into the later part of the season because we typically will seed uh, and, and, and get spinach out earlier in the spring. So it's going to struggle a little bit uh, once we get into the hotter part of the year. So we usually have a spring crop and sometimes a fall crop for our growers that produce spinach. Um, one spinach variety that is really good is baby's uh, leaf hybrid. Um, uh, so within 30 days, you can actually uh, have a crop of that. You can start to harvest it early. Um, if you want it to mature a little bit more, another seven to 10 days, you'll get uh, more leaves from it. Uh, for the first crop, we typically want to sow that early spring, and we can plant again in the late summer after August, um, or actually towards the end of August, we can plant it again for a uh, fall crop. Um, And one of the things that we can use as a substitute, um, if we like the flavor of spinach, uh, this Malabar is actually not a, a true spinach, as you're going to see here in a minute. Um, uh, but it's called New Zealand spinach. And it, it grows, as you see on the right-hand side, you need a trellis or something to support it. Um, when you eat it directly from the field, it has quite a tangy flavor. But when you cook it, it tastes uh, similar to spinach and has the same texture as spinach. So this is something that if you haven't had a chance to uh, try a Malabar spinach, it likes the heat, so it grows very well under the hot summer conditions. Uh, we had it out in our demonstration gardens last year at the Earth Center, uh, and it was doing extremely well out there. It doesn't require a lot of care. Um, you should harvest it on a regular basis. Um, you'll get more leaves from it. So with the Malabar, as you see here, it's a uh, Nice thing about it is it has these uh, juicy and crisp leaves. It has a little bit of a citrusy and a peppery uh, flavor uh, when it's fresh. 
but once you cook it, actually, like I said, it tastes a little bit more like uh, conventional spinach. Uh, it does like the heat. Uh, it's not really a, a direct relative, but a distant relative of, of spinach. Um, but one of the things that I use it for is you can use it in soups and stir fries. It actually has quite a bit of flavor. Uh, so it's great for use in soups and stir fries. Easy to grow. Uh, one of the easiest plants you'll ever grow if you like radish. Um, it's a cool season crop. It likes short days. Um, you know, it'll start to germinate as little as 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So we can actually get out in the garden early on to get radish started right out in the garden. Um, but it'll grow in the range of 55 to 85 degrees. Um, uh, it'll germinate and, and that, you know, and grows best in those cooler temperatures. It actually likes those cooler temperatures in order for it to be crisp and actually have uh, the, the flavor uh, that it, you're typically used to in a radish. Uh, you want to keep it a little bit on the cooler side as we get into later in the season. We can still grow it, um, but it struggles a little bit with the heat depending on the specific variety that we're growing. Um, here are some good varieties that we've grown and they perform very well in pots and containers. So, you know, just because you don't have a lot of garden space doesn't mean you can't grow a lot of these things. Um, Perfecto is a red round that you see here, sparkler, ping pong, Easter egg, and cherry bell. Um, all different types of radish that can be grown in pots or grown directly and seeded directly in the field. Um, Another thing you might want to try is the white-rooted turnips. Uh, even if regular turnips aren't necessarily turnips, uh, the nice thing about these white-rooted turnips is that uh, they're very distinctive flavor, uh, they're very tender, uh, and they're very sweet. So if you haven't tried these, um, and some good selections include Tokyo, which was an All-America selection, Market Express, and Shogun. Um, they're really easy to grow. Um, you can get greens in as little as three weeks if you let them go a little bit longer, uh, then you're actually gonna get the turnip root. Um, and you wanna harvest them when they're young because that's when they're gonna be tender. We don't have uh, disease problems because they have a quick turnaround. Whenever we can grow something quickly in the garden, uh, quickly, uh, we have less problems. Did you have anything you wanted to comment? How about you, Brandon? Any questions? Bill, um, one person asked about locally sourced uh, seeds. Do you want to talk about uh, seed source, or are you going to get into that in a little bit? Um, seed sources, there's there's a lot of good companies out there. I, I don't want to support any one company, but if you, we're going to put a fact sheet online, at one, and it will list um, many of the different sources that are available um, out there. Um, and, and really what I do is I will go to seed companies and I use different seed companies that I've had good luck with. Um, so you can ask your gardening friends, but I, I really don't want to support one seed company over another because many of them are you know, excellent quality. If it's somebody that has a good reputation, that's really what you want to depend on. Any other questions? But we will have some sources. Uh, we'll put a fact sheet on the link that I'm going to show you at the end. Uh, we'll there this week so that it will be different varieties that are available um, and where you can access many of these seed types. Okay, so for tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant culture, um, we typically sow seeds anywhere from four to six weeks uh, before the last frost date uh, of May 15th. We use that as a guide, uh, you know, who knows whether we're going to have frost yet for that. We very well could. Um, and some plants are more sensitive than others. Um, if we're in a greenhouse and we could sow earlier, if we're going to be planting those uh, plants out like tomatoes and protecting them. But eggplant and peppers tend to be more sensitive to the cold, so we don't want to put those out early. Um, sometimes tomatoes, we can get away with you know, putting them out the first week in May as long as we can cover them. Um, you know, or have a, have a row cover or have a basket or something you can put over them if it gets a little cool at night. Um, if you have your plants in a pot, you could simply bring them inside uh, overnight if it gets too cold. Um, and we want to maintain that uh, starter mix temperature of the grow mix to about 75 to 85 degrees if possible. And by doing that, we'll actually maximize germination for those seedlings. Um, and as those first true leaves develop, um, we can transplant and go ahead and, and spot those plants out 
into the containers, as we were talking about before, either two or three inch pots, um, or if we want really stocky transplants, we can go ahead and use four inch pots um, so that we can let them get a little bit bigger before we put them outside. Any questions on that? Okay, so culture, um, one of the things to be very careful of, as we mentioned before, is we want to keep mixes uh, lightly watered so that when you put your finger down into that mix, you can feel moisture down into the mix where the root systems are, um, but not overly saturating. Uh, we can also use slow release uh, forms of nitrogen, you know, like fish emulsion, other materials that are going to be uh, slow to release, but if we see that we're having a nitrogen deficiency problem, we may need to use uh, something like blood meal for going organic or use a um, soluble uh, fertilizer, a complete fertilizer. And a complete fertilizer just means it has nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. You see here that within our greenhouse structure, um, we have fans within that greenhouse which can circulate the air. You can do the same thing within your small setting at home just by having a small fan that blows on your transplants. It's very important for those plants to have that motion and they actually become stronger, those young transplants, uh, when they have wind movement within that greenhouse. Plus, it, it reduces any disease problems we might have by letting those plants dry out properly. Um, here you'll see at the top of this greenhouse, it automatically opens up when we have internal temperatures that start to climb in, into the high 80s and 90s, uh, so we can keep uh, adequate air circulation going through that uh, greenhouse or high tunnel. Any questions there from anyone? So air circulation. Uh, we, we have a question about the slides being available after the webinar. Will they be made available? We, um, we, could, we could post the slides. Um, we will probably post them on one of the, um, uh, probably the county website. So we'll give you a link to that and we can make that available on another week, uh, another week or so. So if you give us a little bit of time, we'll have them posted. Okay. Possibly we'll have this whole presentation posted because we're recording it right now. So if they need to come back to it to listen or watch again, they, they're welcome to do that. We'll have to see what happens in terms of the downloading. Um, any other questions there, Brendan? So hardening. Uh, a question about growing fall spinach, uh, and I'm going to address this a little bit next week, um, but we have someone who has an issue with finding the soil being too hot and getting poor germination from the spinach. Okay. Do you have so, any suggestions? Yes. So for, for germination for spinach, if you can germinate it uh, in a cooler area before you set it outside, like if you want to start the plants in a cooler area and then actually plant them outside, um, and if you use a row cover to shade them a little bit when they get going, uh, to keep them a little bit cooler, uh, keep the soil cooler. You could use straw around areas uh, to keep the soil cool um, or use like a white reflective plastic as well on the, some of those areas. But that's a little bit tough to do uh, with spinach. So I, I probably would just have those in containers if you want to grow it in containers. You could move those or just you know, do what you can to at least germinate them in the cooler temperature so that they can come up and get started. Um, here we're going to talk about hardening off transplants. And then next week you're going to talk about uh, fall, uh, you know, structures that you can build in the fall. So that's going to be interesting because we're going to see some of Brendan's work, which we'll talk about at the end here. Um, hardening off transplants um, is important. And what we mean by hardening off is we gradually expose plants to more sunlight, um, direct sunlight. So we may take plants from the greenhouse or from inside your house, take them outside uh, for a half hour or so, and then gradually increase those plants to light each day for about anywhere from 10 days to 14 days. By doing that, then when we finally set the plants outside for good, uh, then those plants have adjusted to those conditions, um, and it will have less problems with um, stress of those plants going directly out into the full sunlight. So that's called hardening off of transplants. Let's talk about some tomatoes and peppers that are pretty exciting to grow. I have to start off with Rutgers because I work at Rutgers and in the county both, and uh, you know, Rutgers is an old variety back from 1934, and we have the new improved uh, Rutgers 250 as well. Um, but it was an old variety that was developed in cooperation with Campbell's Soup. 
uh, with a crust between JTD and Marglo. Um, still a good slicing and good eating tomato. Uh, at one time, was a predominant tomato that we had in uh, many of the farms that were producing for Campbell's soup and also producing fresh market tomatoes, but that was a long time ago. Um, you can see here that it's an uh, uh, indeterminate plant. It keeps growing in the field. It uh, produces beautiful red fruits that are medium size. Um, it does have fruitarian resistance built in. Uh, typically, the plant is a little bit more compact, so we don't see it grow more than 36 inches uh, in height. Um, but it's one something you can try in as little as 70 days. You can actually have uh, tomatoes that are anywhere from 12 to 14 ounces. Um, so as with any tomato, you want to provide even watering throughout the entire season to keep them healthy. Here's one that we can grow in containers that we have in our greenhouse called Bush Goliath. Um, these are hybrid tomatoes that are compact or they're determinate. So they concentrate when they're a determinate plant, means they focus their growth within a specific period of time. Uh, these guys will reach anywhere from two and a half to three feet tall. Um, we can we start harvesting tomatoes in as little as 65 to 68 days. Um, and most of the fruits are between three to four inches in diameter. Um, they're ideal for containers. We can stake them a little bit in the container so we can provide some uh, additional support from those tomatoes. Um, but you can put them right out in the soil if you want to grow them to have early tomatoes. Uh, the nice thing about bush goliath is they're resistant to nematodes, uh, which are little tiny roundworms that are microscopic. Or they're resistant to verticillium wilt and fusarium wilt. Resistance is a relative term. It doesn't necessarily mean these plants aren't going to have a problem. It just means that uh, the more resistance we have within those plants, the um, greater chance that uh, we're going to see uh, fruits forming without a lot of problems. Uh, one of the varieties that I particularly like is an early tomato, is early girl. Um, small fruits, about five ounces, uh, small to medium size, depending on where you grow them. Uh, and as little as 50 days, uh, we can have fruit that we can harvest. So uh, that's one that I always have in my garden every year. And I think it's a good selection. You can grow that in pots as well. And you know, the three to five gallon uh, pot containers, you can grow most of the peppers and the tomatoes and many of the cucurbits. If you don't have a lot of space in your garden, go ahead and create your own pots just by using the buckets that we talked about earlier, the five-gallon buckets. Um, another favorite of ours is the Celebrity tomato. There's also a new improved Celebrity that's out there. Um, and these are also determinate tomatoes, and they push, tend to push fruit um, a little bit later, but they don't. Um, uh, the nice thing about these guys is that they have a lot of disease resistance built in. Um, we have very few problems of cracking. Uh, the tomato holds up, and it's one of my favorite tomatoes to eat. Um, excellent flavor, and when we've done a taste test in our area, this tomato usually comes out on top. Here you can see the little seedlings coming up, and you don't plant to the left, um, and the tomatoes to the right. Uh, Eight-ounce fruit, uh, about 70 days we'll see these plants. Here's one green zebra, probably not for a beginner. It's a little bit larger plant. Um, I just put this in here to remind me that the larger the plants, the larger the tomato, uh, the longer it's going to take for those tomatoes to develop. So if you're growing them in pots and you want tomatoes early, uh, we probably want to stay away from some of the larger fruited tomatoes. Um, Sun Gold is one of my favorites uh, of the cherry tomatoes. On as little as 60 to 65 days, uh, we go from uh, uh, into a productive plant. Uh, it has the best tasting fruit, I think, that are out there on uh, cherry tomatoes is tangy sweet fruits, um, and you can get them even when they first start to turn orange. The sugar level is unbelievable in these, um, and they're one of the most popular cherry tomatoes that we've ever had up in Ag Field Day. Um, so Sun Gold uh, actually uh, turns this golden orange color as it ripens uh, through the summer. We can get well over 100 tomatoes from each one of the plants because they're tiny little tomatoes, um, but you can just pop them right in your salad or eat them right off the vine. Uh, highly nutritious, a lot of flavor, um, and you want to keep them harvested because by consistently keeping these plants harvested, you're going to have much greater production of all these different varieties just by harvesting on a regular basis. Um, if we just let them sit on the plant, that starts to shut down its productive stage. And so, uh, briefly, we had a couple questions about hardening off. Okay. Uh, that came in. One, um, when hardening off, do you take your plants outside even when it's raining, cold, or overcast? 
No, so you don't want to take plants out if it's cold. Uh, if it's raining, it's fine to take them out because it's overcast. That's fine uh, because you're still uh, getting some, probably some more direct sunlight throughout the day, which they um, will, will get a little more light if they're outside anyway. But you do not want to take them out when it's too cold. So unless that temperature is reasonable, you know, in the 50s, you know, depending on what the plant is, um, you want to make sure that you are um, you are uh, properly uh, extremely cold weather. And uh, for greenhouse plants, do they need to be hardened off as well, especially vegetables, but also flowers? Um, so you're saying they're, they're asking plants that have been grown in a greenhouse to be put outside? Yes. Okay. So some places do harden them off. I, if I were you, I would harden the plants off a little bit. So do the same procedure that we're doing. Um, and by doing that, by taking them out into increased light over a period of days, um, you, you can actually prevent any transplant shock. So, and you could lessen the amount of time you have to do that if they're from the greenhouse, but still may want to do that. But if you're taking a plant from your basement um, where there's very low light conditions instead of a greenhouse, um, you're going to want a little bit longer of a period of hardening off to really uh, protect those plants so they don't go into transplant shock. Another one of my favorite varieties is Super Sweet 100. Uh, produces a lot of small cherry tomatoes. Uh, usually if you have a couple of these plants, you can feed your family and your neighbors as well because they produce a lot of tomatoes. Uh, and when growing the cherries in most of the plants we have here, even if you're growing them in pots, you still want to have some stakes to support them. Uh, and in many cases, if you can grow them inside, uh, you know, uh, any type of um, support structure that you can create, uh, like a cage, for instance, where you can easily reach in and harvest them. If you put a cage around that pot or in tomatoes that's in the ground and then you stake each side of the cage, it's going to keep that pot from turning over. Uh, it'll uh, keep you from losing the plants to heavy winds when the uh, plant is top heavy. So it's a good idea if you can build some type of support cage. If you do have squirrels or something else getting to your tomatoes, you could actually uh, build a chicken wire cage that goes on the outside of that cage to protect them. Um, and then you just lift off that secondary cage off the outside. You just tie it down with some string, lift it off the outside, and then you can reach in to harvest them in the internal cage. Um, and we actually do have a video on that, which we'll make uh, available to people that was um, next week, hopefully. Burpees Big Boy is probably one that you want to avoid. Um, if you're growing in pots, if you're growing out in an open field and you have a cage, you can grow it uh, effectively. Um, you could grow it in a pot, but you would have to make sure that you cage it and stake it properly, uh, otherwise uh, it could topple over. Roma tomatoes are great for paste because they have a much um, uh, lower water content, so it's easier to cook those tomatoes down, uh, and they're ideal for making uh, tomato paste. Um, easy to grow. You can grow Romas. They take a little bit longer to develop, you know, anywhere from 75 to 90 days. Um, depending on temperature and soil conditions and all. Uh, but if you're into making your own uh, tomato sauce, uh, any of the paste tomato varieties, doesn't have to be wrong, but any of the paste tomato varieties are easy to grow um, and um, easy to turn into paste. And the nice thing about some of these varieties is they have resistance to fusarium and um, verticillium welts as well. Some of the, my favorite peppers, one of them is the yes. Peppers. One more, one more oh. thing on tomatoes, if you could, sir. Sure. Yep. Um, I think it, this, this might be worth talking about. We had uh, one person ask, um, last year after the tomatoes were grown in, in containers, they had holes in them after they matured and different sized fruits from the same plant, um, possibly talking about blossom end rot. So maybe that might be well, blossom end rot is blossom end rot is when the bottom of the fruit turns black, and that's from a calcium deficiency. That could also be from improper water uptake from the soil. So when you get black at the bottom of the fruit, uh, that's what's called blossom end rot. And what it means is, at a certain stage when the tomato was developing, it either didn't take up water or didn't take up the proper amount of calcium. It's really a calcium deficiency. But if there was a lapse in the irrigation of that area then you can have blossom end rot. Other holes can be caused by various insects. So if that's the case, you gotta take a little bit closer look. You might wanna bring it into your local cooperative extension office uh, or send some pictures if you see certain insects out there. 
um, we might be able to tell you what's getting into those. Um, there are other types, other things that can be causing damage in your garden, so it's best to kind of keep an eye on things uh, closely so that we can determine and, uh, exactly what's causing the problem. Um, hopefully that answers their question. Um, but we have the diagnostic lab at Rutgers, which is great. We also have each county has their own helpline, uh, which you can reach out to our master gardeners that have been trained. Um, and at the end, we'll tell you how to log on to our helplines in each county. Um, and, it's in, uh, and there's a lot of uh, highly trained master gardeners that can help you answer a lot of those questions. Brendan, any other questions? So some of my favorite peppers to grow um, include the sweet peppers, the um, uh, banana peppers, and, and these are actually a variety to the right here. These three to four inch peppers are called yummy peppers. One of the easiest peppers for uh, a beginner or starter grower to grow, and they produce abundant fruits. Where we have them out in our fields, uh, when you look out, it's a sea of orange out in the field because these things produce uh, incredible production on these things, and the flavor on them is outstanding. So probably one of the easiest peppers to grow because of that. It's just very productive, um, and you want to keep it harvested on a regular basis and share it with friends and neighbors. Um, Jalapenos are also easy to grow. You can grow all of these pepper varieties in a three or five gallon bucket. Um, you don't need a large area to grow peppers uh, successfully. Uh, and the hot peppers can be grown successfully as well. Most of the tomato varieties that we talk about in peppers are self-pollinating, but they do need the wind shaking back and forth and um, movement in the air so that they can be properly uh, formed fruits um, and pollinated. So they don't necessarily need the bees, but they do need to be, and when we grow them in greenhouses, we have a little device where we go along, we can actually sh um, it vibrates each plant a little bit so that it properly uh, will form fruit. Any questions on that? Uh, another interesting plant to try is called Mexican sour gherkins. And um, uh, it tastes, uh, it, it has a very fascinating flavor to it. It actually looks like a, a little tiny watermelon. Um, tastes a little bit like a cucumber, um, but it's not. It's not even in the cucumber family. Uh, but they're called Mexican mini sour gherkins. And um, they need full sun and they like to climb. So if you're going to grow these guys, um, make sure you have a trellis for them. Um, and they can be used just like cucumbers and have a little bit of a sweet citrusy flavor to them. Um, and they can be used just like a cucumber. And you just actually harvest them. When they get this size is when you harvest them. They're extremely productive. Uh, you just have to make sure that you have well-drained soil or mix that you're growing them in. You can grow them in pots. Um, I've grown them in pots and had a trellis that they grow up into. Uh, and they can get quite big if you give them the right amount of nutrients and uh, uh, fertility and uh, full sunlight. Um, you'll see a lot of these produced throughout the season. Uh, they're one to two inch fruits. Um, and you don't want to let them sit on the plant too long because they start to get a little pithy when they sit on the plant too long. And you can start these indoors. I, I, I typically would start about two weeks before the last frost date um, because you want to put these out after it's when you know that there's going to be no danger of frost because otherwise they're very sensitive to frost. Any questions out there, Brendan? Uh, we have a question on saving seed. Okay. Um, what's the best way to collect seed if you have a plant variety that you really like? Okay, so at the end of the season, um, we actually will have a later session on collecting or saving seed where we'll actually go through the whole procedure uh, of saving seed because typically uh, we'll take a quality fruit that we want to save seeds from and we'll only save seeds uh, if it's an heirloom variety or open pollinated. Um, and we will put a fact sheet on there of how we basically – um, uh, you know, we'll take the fruit, let it sit in a container for a while and, until it actually separates out the seed and the seed coat. Um, but we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail when we get to that point and we'll actually put some information on the website about it. Because it's, it's not really that complicated, but you have to know what seeds you can save versus those you don't. I mean, you're not going to save seeds of many of the vegetables that are horse hybrids because they're not going to produce true to the original. But if you had some heirloom and you wanted to save some of those seeds, um, you could do that. Um, the problem with saving seeds, too, is that if you save seeds and they happen to have 
uh, disease, uh, bacterial different diseases that can occur within that plant, you'd also uh, transfer that onto the next generation. So you got to make sure that uh, the seeds that you're saving are from fruit that are not diseased. Now let's talk about zucchini a little bit. One of the easiest to grow crops, as long as you don't have squash vine borer, uh, is zucchini. Uh, one of the varieties, it's an All-America selection. So wherever you see AAS after a variety, it means that it's an All-America selection. Um, there are many varieties that are easy to grow. The nice thing about this is that it's a bush-type plant, so you could grow it in a container if you, if you want to. You want to make sure that zucchini plants do not go out until way after the frost, so probably third week of May, um, then you would put your zucchini out there unless you can protect them. Um, these bush-like plants can produce fruit anywhere from six to eight inches long. You want to make sure you harvest your zucchini when they're this size. If you let them get too big, like a baseball bat, they're really not worth eating at that point unless you're going to make zucchini bread out of them. Um, but we tend to um, harvest them uh, when they're young and tender like this, six to eight inches long, and when they're nice and, and bright green like you see here on the right. Um, we can see, depending on the, the particular variety, we can harvest anywhere from 52 to 57 days depending on how, uh, what the temperatures are like. We can also protect these guys from squash vine borer by setting them out a little bit later in, in the season. Um, the first flush of flowers on, on many of these are usually males, uh, depending on the, the type of plant. So after the first flush of flowers, then after that, we would remove the um, uh, row cover that's protecting these plants um, so that we wouldn't have squash vine borer and also that we could get pollinators in there because we need to have pollinators in order to have uh, summer squash produced. We can also grow, um, start the uh, other types of uh, uh, hard squash, uh, winter squash as well in the greenhouse or in your home, uh, and they will store for longer periods of time. Also need to be put out after the last frost. Any questions on that or prob any problems you may have had? Brendan, do you see any questions out there? Uh, you did answer the question about the squash vine borers. Uh, okay. Yeah, we did answer it. Um, the squash vine borer, like I said, you plant a little bit later in the season. Use row covers uh, in the beginning if you can until they produce their second flush of flowers. Flowers are actually edible too, but you don't want to eat all the flowers. Otherwise, you're not going to eat fruit. But the first set of flowers that come off of them um, are considered a delicacy. Uh, there are many varieties of cucumbers that will grow very nicely in containers. Um, as long as you provide good drainage, they have pollinators, you have a good balance of nutrients. Um, you're going to see varieties like Space Master, Fanfare, Patio Smacker, Bush Champion. There's a lot of varieties now that have been developed uh, for smaller spaces and for containers. Um, you also want to provide a trellis for cucumbers so that they will be supported by that trellis. You want to harvest the fruit, uh, you know, six to eight inches long. You don't want to let the fruit get oversized. Um, uh, so that you will get abundant uh, production with the cucumbers. Also, the small cucumbers are going to have a lot more flavor. Uh, some of the newer cucumbers that are called burpless cucumbers uh, have less cucurbitacin in them. So um, because of that, uh, they tend to cause less gas problems for people. But if they have a lower amount of cucurbitacin, they also attract uh, fewer insects that typically can feed on these guys. So there's a double uh, benefit to having uh, burpless cucumbers, uh, less insect problems in many cases. Um, and if you grow a variety that you can grow in a container like the ones listed here, uh, you'd be able to grow them and put them right in the sunlight. Cucumbers, as with tomatoes, peppers, and uh, melons, all like full sun. So that's why it's, it's best if you don't have a lot of sun in your backyard or where you typically grow plants. If you have them in a container, you can put that container right out where you've got uh, majority of sunlight, you're going to have much healthier plants with less problems. Any questions there? Um, we're getting towards the end here, so we're going to finish up pretty soon. A lot of different varieties of beans. Beans can be extremely productive. Uh, the one thing about beans is that we need to keep them harvested on a very regular basis. Um, any varieties that you see here, like Blue Lake has been around for a while. Uh, you know, when these beans start are still on the um, bright green side. And that's when you want to harvest them. You don't want to let them start to turn brown or get too large. Uh, when you harvest beans early, uh, they're going to be more tender. There are many varieties out there that are stringless. 
uh, and as long as you harvest them early in the season. One like Derby is an All-America selection uh, and can be produced in as little as 55 days. So uh, in that early syrup, in as little as 45 days, we can actually see beans. We can use pots for these uh, as well. Some uh, use or are pulled beans and others are not. Some are actually just um, actually individual plants and form more of a bush type structure. Uh, one of my favorites at the bottom is a French filet bean called mascot bean. Uh, and that's uh, the flavor on that is just absolutely out of this world. So there's a lot of different varieties that uh, you can look towards, and you want to try some different varieties too until you get the ones that do well under your conditions. Uh, and like I said, in as well as 45 days, you can have many of these varieties producing adequate production. Just want to make sure you're harvesting them on a regular basis. Uh, what are in conservation tips? We want to order deeply and infrequently. Um, uh, you know, unless that plant you just reach down, what you, what you want to do is you want to water down into the soil, but not water the tops of the plants. So we're watering the tops, and we may be watering once a day. You don't want to water all throughout the day. Uh, you want to make sure that you're getting that water penetration down where the roots are. You can use trickle irrigation, and you can mulch around plants with compost um, to help lock some of that moisture in to those plants. Uh, you want to make sure the plants get at least one and a half to two inches of irrigation or water per week. But you always want to take a look at the edge of the uh, plant's leaves. If they start to turn color, they start to curl up, if the plant starts to wilt, you need to get out there and make sure that you're watering, but don't overwater those areas. Um, and with that, we're going to wrap it up. I do want to bring up a poll that we're going to um, share with everyone. Um, also, if you uh, look on this URL here for Middlesex County Grows, um, if you put that in after HTTPS uh, and then uh, colon and slash two slash forwards and then tinyurl.com forward slash Middlesex uh, County Grows, um, you'll be taken to our website um, where you can find some of these fact sheets that will give you an overview of some of the information I have and I'll actually give you a little bit or information on varieties. And we'll be posting information to that area uh, over the next couple of weeks, uh, the next four to six weeks as we have these sessions. You can also visit our mobile device site um, by text uh, extension to 56512. Um, and I do have a poll here that I'd like everyone to take. Let me see if I can get to the poll. If I can just chime in. No one has to put in the HTTPS stuff, really. If you just do the tinyurl.com slash Middlesex County Grows, that'll take you to our county website, and you could get the uh, fact sheet Bill mentioned. Now, everyone, Dave, does everyone see the poll out there? Is it, is it apparent on there? Um, yeah, the poll did come up. Start, if you guys could start to fill out the poll, we'd love to have your feedback. Um, thanks for being patient with us because we're all we're going to have to use WebEx and, and do long-distance training. We'd love to have commit, you come out and visit us at the Earth Center when things calm down, uh, hopefully in a couple months or whenever that happens. Um, we have beautiful demonstration gardens out there. Um, and I would like to thank everyone that joined us today, uh, all the participants um, out there. Uh, I wish I could have seen your faces because of big teaching. I do a lot of teaching at the university, at the county level, and um, I do like seeing the audience. So hopefully you learned something new today that you can share with your family and friends. And uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Next week we have, Brendan, you want to give them an overview of what you're going to talk about next week? Yeah, so um, I'm going to, next week I'll be going a little bit more into garden infrastructure, uh, raised beds and how to make use of them, some information on building and the materials you would use. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about irrigation systems for the home garden, uh, drip irrigation that you can set up, some animal protection, tips for season extension, building your own low tunnels, and uh, I'm going to talk about some varieties for growing either earlier in the spring or later in the fall, you know, gr greens and things like that, and plants that you can put out in the fall for an early spring harvest the next year. Also, uh, not to, to give away, but you're going to talk about some gadgets. I won't say what they were, but they're oh yeah, fun technology for the garden. Inexpensive, really fun technology to help you if you have a, a tunnel outside. Every Wednesday, just to let everybody know, if you have gardening questions, you can join us on our helpline live. 
Um, and you can email our master gardeners at co.middlesex.nj.us if you have questions. Um, we have a team of wonderful master gardeners that are there to help answer questions throughout the week. And the helpline live is on every Wednesday at 10. If I may, one more time, thank you for joining us. But also, if you want to get that fact sheet that Bill mentioned, please do follow that uh, address, tinyurl.com backslash Middlesex County Grows, and you'll get to our county extension website, and you can get that information and learn all about our programs and departments. We also have the Earth Day at Home series videos. Yes, that's a great video. Check out from our Rutgers Environmental Stewards. Uh, they're, they're on Mondays at 6.30, and there's this little tiny URL you could dip into your browser to get access to our Environmental Stewards for their Monday night show. That's tinyurl.com, Earth Day at Home. Also, our local 4-H department has some presentations coming up as well. If you want to find out about 4-H for your kids and your family, do the, the, uh, go to the address tinyurl.com, 4-H Presents, and you can see their schedule. Uh, we're we're going to be on every Thursday at uh, 6.30, and we'd love to see you again. And to, to make sure you get invited, just visit tinyurl.com, Middlesex County Grows, which brings you to our county webpage. And uh, there'll be a button there to, that you'll click and get that email invite to the program. And you can also email our master gardeners with your address with ConCon as the subject. And we'll make sure you get on our constant contact emailing list for all our programs. That's going to be it for us, and we look forward to uh, seeing you next time on Are You Ready to Garden?